strong sixteen of the king's wild deer, he sold him in Bohaddy. When she rode down and in the king's hall, there were lords and ladies plenty. Down on a bended knee she fall, and she begged for the life of a Geordie. Cry six pretty blades are left by him, another one lies in my body. Freely I part with each one of them, if you give me the life of a Geordie. For he never stole ox, he never stole ass, he never murdered any. He stole sixteen of the king's wild deer, he sold them in The judge looked over his left shoulder and cries, I'm sorry for thee. My three fair maid, you come too late, for he's been condemned already. Oh, the Geordie shall hang in a chain of gold, such chains as never was any. Because he came of the royal blood and he's courted by the young lady. Oh, he never stole ox, he never stole ass. He never murdered any. He stole sixteen of the king's wild deer. He sold them in Bohemia. I wish I had you in the underground, where times I have been many. With my broad sword and a pistol, do I fight you for the life of a Geordie? For he never stole ox, he never stole ass, he never murdered any. He stole sixteen of the king's wild deer, he sold an in Bohemia. Sowed some seeds. It's about two things <coughs> male guilt and male panic. Thank 
just doing so, doing so. they do it's a thing called Banbury Bill
court of the damsel. I learned off a fella called Bill Prince. Actually, he comes from um, just along the road, uh, just outside Brig.
I've got an invitation to go to a funeral, but to my sad misfortune, now the fellow didn't die. The manager, he said, he was vexed at disappointing us, but he apologised, and might we let the thing go by? To make up for disappointing us, he took us in and treated us, he bought pints of porter for the company of ten. Until one fellow questioned him his money, he was squandering so. We put the fellow's eyelid into mourning there and then. Now the owner of the beer shop, when he saw our solar coming, he gave orders to his dictus, but of course we did refuse. So he whistled up some loungers who were sitting in the corner, and for ten or fifteen minutes we were badly abused. <laughs> then we left the beer shop and down the street did stagger, and a gang of corner boys started pelting us with mud. We told them to go easy, and they said that they were doing so and so. We turned on them and left them lying where they stood. Now, <laughs> the next that we met was a gang of salvationers. They rifled all our pockets, and they asked us, were we saved? And little Mick McGinty was invited to the station for inquiring of a policeman if his appetite was shaved. To make up McGinty's pail, we all took off our undershirts, and down to the pawn shop we took the jolly lot. We asked for ten and sixpence, the price of free McGinty, but he's had enough already was the answer that we got. So we got the ten and sixpence and went off to free McGinty, but the devil take the beer shop that met us on the way. For we couldn't pass the corner without taking some refreshment, and we spent every penny of the fine we had to pay. Then we bought a concertina for to make the high hilarity, though none of us could play, though we tried our best and worst. We knocked a lot of noise from it, if it was any benefit, we handled it so gentle that the bellows it did burst. So we got some hot potatoes for to mend the concertina, and then someone hit Maloney with the carcass of a cat. He buttoned up his whiskers and began to read the riot act. He swore he'd put two heads upon the villain who did that then. Maloney hit McGinty and McGinty hit some other man and everyone hit anyone to whom he owed a spite. And the cripple McNamara who was sitting saying nothing got a kick that burst his eye for not indulging in the fight. <laughs> The drinking it was innocent, the sense was nearly out of us, as for a bit of rioting we quickly did prepare. We battered one another till we were worth three halfpence, and I'm sure there was a carpet on the floor of skin and hair. We battered one another till the ponies separated us. They marched us off to jail with broken noses and black eyes. They marched us off to jail, and for me it was a lesson for to never go to funerals until the fellow dies. <laughs> Something 
which you could hear, yeah. which was in fairly good nick. None of the stuff was in wonderful nick. It was all damaged in one way or another. Some of it was recyclable. I don't know about you, but I get quite, uh, quite excited about things like that. I just like hearing old recordings. And if it's 1905, I get more excited. There was actually a wonderful program on the radio. Did anybody hear it? About early days of recording. Recordings of Caruso made in 1902. And another fellow who was his big rival, that nobody had ever heard of nowadays, has ever heard of nowadays. He made two recordings in his life and they had one of them there. Wonderful stuff. Anyway, well, hold on. This is uh, uh, the way somebody in England, because his name was, for some reason, they didn't record who the bloke was who was singing the song. The bloke who recorded it decided that it wasn't important enough for him to put his name on it either. So, from, uh, somewhere in England, some old bloke was singing a song called The Banks of the Nile like this. Well, he didn't have a guitar, but uh, this is what he sang.
sound this off um, a record of the young tradition uh, who were around until about 1968. Now two of them live in the United States and one of them lives in Keighley. about the fox hunt, <coughs> which you might be forgiven for thinking was written by the fox.
Cowders is a woman who carves wool.
and to me call the day, she and I keep our shuttles in play. For I went to my love bedroom door, where I had been many times before, but I could not speak. Part of factory made, a factory made, no way she be. Blessed is the man that enjoys she. Of an old soldier come from sea, musket all over his shoulder, and it's on pretty Peggy cast his eye. She put her eye on the soldier, of a gold, the silver shall be thine. Give you all the gold and the thunder, if you leave all your damned, your husband dear, and you'll sail the sea with the soldier. John husband, he mounted his high horse back, expecting for the meat of other water. Oh, but when he got there, it was late in the day, but she fled on the sea with the soldier. Kicked her and he called her whore, left her on the wild sea, should I wonder? 
as Peggy walked up and as Peggy walked down. They asked her where she was going. She made not an answer, she couldn't tell where, but she fled on the sea with a soldier. cylinders that came from this cardboard box on safari. Um, we actually did manage to identify the, the name of the singer on this, uh, this particular one. It was a woman, probably, I mean it's certainly a woman, but it's probably a woman called 
<coughs> called Harriet Verrill. <coughs> Certainly the woman, woman on it has got the most amazing East Sussex accent you've ever heard. And the chances are it is her. And if it was her, it is her, it's recorded by Vaughan Williams. My wife and I had a, a long argument about whether this song was eggs in her basket or not, because it's, I mean, it's pretty distorted <coughs> on the recording. We spent a couple of days, up. she swore it was and I swore it wasn't, and then we managed to identify one line which proved that she was right. And then in four days flat we got the rest of the words. Have you listened to one song for four days? You get to know it quite well. <coughs> I made up. 
Um, I'll play you the tune I made up. Uh, it's a tune called Mac Vey. It's named after um, a fellow I met in Ireland, a fellow called John McVeigh. Met him in about 1974. It's one of those sudden friendships you make. I was doing this tour of Ireland, and I wasn't used to touring in Ireland. I'd been to Belfast and I'd been to Dublin, but I'd never been to Ireland, right? So I really wasn't used to what it was like. And being from London, I wasn't used to the fact that if you go into a small town in Ireland and you walk down the street carrying two guitars, everybody stares at you. Very quietly and calmly like that. They stare at you. And if you look at them, they give you this absolutely astounding nod like that. And they carry on staring at you. And that nod means everything. From hello to did you watch Neighbours. <laughs> if you've got a video. Come in, come in. So, um... I was about four days into this tour and there'd been a lot of staring going on and I knew that when I got to Tullamore it was a, a walk straight right from the railway station into town, right through the middle of town and right out the other side, about two miles and it was a Saturday and everybody was in town. <coughs> so it's going to be a two mile gauntlet. So, um, I was, like I say, I was fairly tense, fairly paranoid by this time. And I'm walking through the town. I go everywhere by public transport, so you know, I can't drive. So I'm walking through the middle of town, and this, um, to make things worse, I mean, there's the usual staring going on, so that one stair is being passed along to the next stair, and there's two mile of continuous stairs, and I'm staring straight ahead. And there's this one bloke who's walking by my side, sort of, just a bit out of reach, just a bit too far away to say hello to, and just too close for comfort, and he's pacing like that and staring all the time, so. And after a while he came across and he, uh, and he fell very elaborately in step with me and he said, um, Hello, you're going to Bunkana tomorrow, aren't you? And I said, uh, well, yes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. Well, to get to Bunkana, see, from Tullamore, right in the middle, and Bunkana's right up at the top. And in order to get there by public transport, you've got to do this amazing horseshoe through Dublin and Belfast and Derry, and then you go back across the border. So, I said, yeah, I'm going to Bunk Bunk Canada tomorrow. He said, great, I think I'll come too. I said, fine, <laughs> terrific. How do you do, he says, my name is John, John McVeigh. How do you do, he says, I, I'm Mark. He says, yes, I know. Oh, all right, hello, carry on walking, he says. He chats away, he, I, I say we talked, we didn't talk, he talked. He just talked. Yep, 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 yep. And uh, by the time we reached the, the club, these other two fellows had done the same thing, falling very elaborately in step with us, and they'd introduced themselves, <coughs> and they said, hello, my name's Mick, hello, my name's Jagger. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to bunk around tomorrow, you're going to bunk around tomorrow. Yes, yes. Think I'll come too, think I'll come too. Fine, okay. So the four of us go to the club at uh, Tullamore, and we have a great time, and we go back to Athlone to stay the night, um, and we just sit up talking until about five o'clock in the morning, whereupon Johnny McVeigh suddenly announces that everybody has to go to bed because we've got to leave at half past eight on the dot. So we all go to bed and we all get up and we have breakfast and we leave at half past eight on the dot because he's a policeman. So on the dot, we're there in his car, which he hasn't told us about before. We're in his car and we're setting off for Bunkrana. <coughs> and at exactly half past eight in the evening, we pulled up, out, pulled up outside the folk club in Bunkrana. It's hard to argue with that sort of timing, isn't it? Even though there might be lurking in the back of your mind the notion that this 12 hour journey ought to have taken four hours. <laughs> the reason it took 12 hours was because we visited all John McVeigh's friends on the way. We had loads to drink and loads to eat. We had, we had lunch three times. <laughs> Great. By the time we got to the gig, I mean, it was wonderful. <laughs> Great time. I had a great time at the gig, <coughs> and um, we all set off the next day for um, Carrick and the west of Donegal to find a fiddle player called Johnny Doherty, who was a really beautiful fiddle player. He was about 82 years old at that time, and he played six nights a week, a week in the pub for his, for his bed and board. And Sunday he wouldn't play because he went to church. Um, absolutely wonderful player. Four days of music with this bloke. And at the end of the four days, <coughs> I was very unhappy about it because I had to get the bus from Donegal City back to Dublin because I had a gig to do. And then they came and they put me on the bus and then they all buggered off back to Carrick to have some more music. And I never saw this Johnny McVeigh fellow ever again. <coughs> Sudden friendship. Although 
what, six days? Five, six days? So, um, about, I, I can never quite work out whether it's eight or ten years later, but it's something like that. There's an Irish musician friend of mine sitting in Dublin airport, and he's coming to the Beverly Festival. And his route is Dublin, Manchester, get the train, Manchester, Hull, another train, Hull, Beverly, and then he's there, okay? And the plane's late. So he's sitting there, he's chewing his, planes are always late. He's chewing his fingernails, but he's not too bothered. He knows, he knows he's going to get there anyway. And this bloke walks up to him as he's sitting there in the lounge, and he says, uh, Hello, you're going to the Beverly Festival, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. And he wasn't so phased about it as, uh, phased at it as I was, but he's used to it, and he's Irish, so he's used to people doing things like that. No, you're going to the Beverly Festival. Yes, he does. Oh, that's interesting, says he. Yep, 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 yep. And he sits down, they yep, yep. Carry on talking for about 20 minutes or half an hour. And finally, their flights are called, <coughs> and they're on different flights. But their flights are called about the same time, and they stand up and they shake hands, goodbye, very nice to meet you, hope to run into you again sometime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a nice time at the Beverly Festival. Great. So my friend turns to walk away, and this bloke won't let go of his hand. <coughs> and he turns back, and he's looking at him with a slight frown on his face. By the way, he says, Did you know that Johnny McVeigh has died? And this mate of mine said, who the hell is Johnny McVeigh? Right. He didn't know him. Who the hell is Johnny McVeigh? Oh, never mind, says the bloke. Doesn't matter. Goodbye, nice to talk to you. And off he goes. My mate gets onto the plane, he gets to Manchester, gets the train from the station to, to, to Hull. By that time, the, everything is that late that he's got to jump straight into a taxi and go straight to the gig, which is what he does. Gets out of the taxi, he's got a lot of instruments, heaves all the instruments out, gets them to the side of the stage and start, starts to tune them up. Because he's got to think of a set list and he's got to tune up and he's got about 20 minutes. And I walk in, <coughs> I say, hello, how are you? And he says, leave me alone, I'm tuning up. Okay, so I stand off, and I'm silent, sort of companionably silent, while he tunes up. And there's a gap in his tuning, and I lean across and I say, how's Johnny McVeigh? And he froze on the fretboard. <laughs> and he looked up with glassy stare, and he said, he's dead. And he burst out laughing. Which is a fairly good reason for writing a tune for somebody. This tune is for us, for John McVeigh. <laughs> After that, there's a tune called uh, Hommage à Rock Crew, which is another tune from Quebec. And this was named for a disc jockey called Rock Crew. <coughs>
there was a woman and she lived on her own. She slaved on her own and she skivvied on her own. She two little girls and two little boys and she lived alone with her husband. For her husband he was a hunk of a man, a chunk of a man and a drunk of a man. He was a hunk of a drunk and skunk of a man, such a boozing, bruising husband. For he would come out drunk each night, he thrashed her black and he thrashed her white. He thrashed her to within an inch of her life, then he slept like a log did her husband. One night she gathered her tears all round her shame, she thought of the bruising and cried with the pain. Oh, you'll not do that ever again, I won't live with a drunken husband. But as he lay and snored in bed, a strange old thought came into her head. She went for the needle, went for the thread, and went straight into her sleeping husband. And she started to stitch with a girlish thrill, with a woman's heart and a seamstress skill. She bibbed and tucked with an iron will, all around her sleeping husband. Oh, the top sheet. The bottom sheet too, the blanket stitched to the mattress through. She stitched and stitched for the whole night through, and then she waited the dawn at her husband. And when her husband awoke with a pain in his head, he found that he could not move in bed. Sweet Christ, I lost the use of my legs, but this wife just smiled at her husband. Pour in her hand, she held the frying pan with a flutter in her heart. She gave him a lamb. He could not move, but he cried, God oh, damn, don't you swear, she cries to her husband. And then she thrashed him black, she thrashed him blue with the frying pan and the colander too. With the rolling pin, just a stroke or two, such a battered and bleeding husband. And she says, if you ever come home drunk any more, I'll stitch you in and I'll thrash you more. Then I'll pack my bag and I'll be out the door. I'll not live with a drunken husband. Ooh, isn't it true what small can do with a thread and a bought and a stitch or two? He's wiped his slate and his boozing's through. It's goodbye to a drunken husband. <laughs>
Why did you waste the summer? Summers don't last forever. You're just an idle beggar. You must pay the price. Sad advice, you wouldn't need me. Took life easy. Tame punishment that follow. Now see the grasshopper reel like a dry leaf falling, weaving a dance that will last forever. Back comes the ant to his nest to work, to feed, to rest. A hymn that will always be tomorrow. The ant and the grasshopper, everyone knows how the story goes. How the ant was diligent, never spent anything lightly. Labored wisely and gathered in store for tomorrow. As for the grasshopper, glad of the summer sunshine, tied as the wind on broken water. His song gave to the summer day, singing, Where the dance leads, I'll four things that are on the face of it fairly on the face of it they're fairly ordinary I mean everyday things like a cone boot lace but they have to be done in a particular order otherwise it's no good Silver bounds and ten, as hand 
Lacking fifty bells and this goodly gift shall be your own. Take back to my own true love, your turn again, that she might bear her baby son. Of a child she'll never like to bleed, nor from sickness will she ever be bleed. But she will die, and she will turn to clay, and you will wed with another maid. And Sidney says, This weary man, and back to his own true love, he's born again. I wish my life was at an end. Unless the that you 
and oozes Would let her light up me That she might bear her baby boy It was plain, no one did But I wish dogs What were knit amongst this lady locks And it was plain, who took out the combs of hair Braided in amongst this lady's hair And it was plain, the world's the kid did slay Death of the buffalo, birth of the blues, eyeballs and hot dogs, two legged booze, honest. Job. 
John Millet Man tried and turned America. Dumbo, Rambo, Bonzo, Sue Ellen, J.R. America. For Elvis and Bing and the Cadillac car. Space age technology, a stone age finesse. <laughs> but getting us all in one hell of a mess with your God save America, God damn the rest. America. Nixon, Kissinger, bombs in Vietnam. America. That sly redneck huckster they call Uncle Sam. For the sake of the thousands of children who die, for your generals, your senators, your presidents who lie to their Mickey Mouse morals, Neanderthal pride. America. Showbiz and all the rise and the tars. America. Uncle Tom's cabin, chain gang, Alcatraz. Las Vegas and crap and amusement arcades, Q Klux Klan, Billy Graham and moral crusades, America, we stand against you. Came on the TV. There were twenty screens in the showroom window. Pictures 
marching large and strong. As the wind on fire heard a sigh, oh, an old woman down and boy called him Jack, they called him John. He was there, sat tied up short. They caught him cold in the heat of a battle for the South Atlantic Company store. Dance in the Iron Lady 